I believe we are on the brink, if not the beginning, of the greatest move of God in history. But when Holy Spirit moves, unfortunately, you have counterfeits that are moving as well. There are false prophets. Jesus said there would be false prophets with false signs and wonders. But I believe God wants to give you wisdom and discernment to recognize and distinguish the true from the false. So join us today and you will learn how to walk in supernatural discernment. Welcome to The Resting Place, a place where you will experience the supernatural presence and power of God both in and upon you, where you will meet face to face with the Holy Spirit in a tangible way, and where you will encounter signs, wonders, and miracles. Join Larry Sparks, prophetic teacher, lecturer on revival, and publisher for Destiny Image today, as together we enter into The Resting Place. Welcome to The Resting Place. I'm your host, Larry Sparks, and this show is all about teaching you how to create a resting place in your life for the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit. One end times prophecy you can take to the bank and you can trust. Acts chapter 2, where Peter is restating Joel to, in the last days, God declares, I'll pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Now, I'm so grateful to have a prophetic friend with me today, Jennifer LeClaire. I've known you now for many years. I'm grateful for the integrity, accuracy you walk in when it comes to the prophetic. But you've written a book that really goes for the jugular, <laughs> Discerning Prophetic Witchcraft. Every time I say the title, people are like, whoa, whoa, because we're there right now. Now, here's the deal. Jesus did say in the last days we would have false prophets. Mm -hmm. But if there are false prophets, that must mean there are true prophets. So Jennifer, let me let me ask you this because we're gonna I, I want to go head on after some of these more con controversial topics. What does a true prophet look like? Yeah, and that's a great question because if there are false prophets, there have to be true ones because the only thing Satan can do is counterfeit. It's counterfeit. So a true prophet in the New Testament. The primary function is found in Ephesians 4. Yeah. Jesus ascended, ascended to heaven. He gave gifts to men, some apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers, for the equipping mm. of the saints for the work of the ministry. So as a New Testament prophet, a New Testament prophet should be actively equipping others to hear the voice of God for themselves. This negates the dependency on the prophet to tell you what God is saying to you. Jesus said, my sheep know my voice and the voice of another, the voice of a stranger, they're not gonna follow it. And so that means that of course, prophets are gonna prophesy. Of course, it's like saying a dog's not gonna bark, but the primary purpose of a dog is not to bark. Mm. And the primary purpose of a prophet in the New Testament is not to prophesy, or should I say not to predict yep. future events. It's not to predict the weather. It's that's what we have meteorologists for. It's yes. not to predict world crises. You know, it's, it's, it is to equip the believers to hear the voice of the Lord for themselves. I, I love that because number one, a prophet is a gift. They should be a gift to the body of Christ. And I love, I mean, that is the definition that I've been running with now for many years, because I believe the prophet's supposed to equip every single believer mm -hmm. how to hear God for themselves. They should not be acting as a mediator between mm -hmm. people and God. Otherwise, I mean, what the prophet does is they draw people to them and their ministry as opposed to directing people to God. Well, and we see that, especially through social media proliferation, yeah. where you know, even I have a, a prayer broadcast five days a week, and people will comment while I'm praying, I need a word, please prophesy to me. Yeah. And that's because we have inadvertently, perhaps, the body of Christ has created a culture of give me a word, give me a word, give me a word, where the prophet has been elevated to his position where the prophet can hear better than we can. Mm. Nobody can hear from me better than I can hear from me. Right. That's so good. I mean, you know, I hear from the Lord for myself. You know, as a prophet, I I can minister out of an anointing to you, to you, to you. But as a believer, I have to hear the voice of the Lord for myself. And so we've got to not keep putting prophets on a pedestal and thinking they're somehow more spiritual than we are. They just have a different anointing. Yeah, it's interesting because I started this segment talking about we are in the days, I believe, of this great outpouring. You have a wonderful book about the next great move of God. I mean, I have so many friends right now. They're on the front lines of revival and your book has really helped save their lives and their ministries because wow. you have so 
many people, you've got the false being attracted to the true. Can you talk about that a little bit? Because when you have a true move of God going on, sometimes you'll have false, goofy, weird stuff showing up. Why does that happen? You know, I, I think it happens for a few reasons. False prophets are opportunists. Wow. False prophets are wolves in sheep's clothing. And so they, they find themselves in the midst of hunger and mm. they can easily exploit a hungry person. Look, if I'm starving, I haven't eaten in three days, you know, I'm gonna f eat pretty much whatever you give me, right? But if I eat well every, every day, I, I'm eating nutritious food, I'm not gonna be as tempted by something that I know is not good for me. And so the temptation is there in the midst of hunger. Uh, yeah, everybody wants a word, everybody wants to see. We've seen revivals in the past that have gone wrong where there were wrong spirits operating behind the scenes, but people ignore the warning signs because they were so hungry for the anointing and yeah. that's part of the issue. Well, and I believe a book like this is really helping, helping sharpen discernment. That's one of the gifts of the Spirit that I feel like sometimes is neglected. We love the showy demonstrative gifts and, that, and that's great. They give God great glory, but discerning of spirits. I mean, very briefly, what, what would you or how would you define the gift of discerning of spirits? Well, it's a gift of the Holy Spirit that helps us to distinguish between good and evil. Mm. At the baseline foundation, it helps us to distinguish between what is of God and what is not of God. Yeah. You know, uh, 1 John 4, 1 says to test the spirits to see if they're of God. Yeah, yeah. Why? Because many false prophets have gone out into the world. And so we have to test or discern. Paul said in, Thessalo uh, in uh, Thessalonians 5, test all things, yes. hold fast to that which is good. So discerning is putting something to the test. Yeah. It's judging not from a place of criticism, mm. but it's judging from a place of a plumb line mm. to the Word of God, the ways of God, the will of God. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, it's interesting because different translations in 1 Corinthians 12, they translate discerning of spirits, distinguishing of different kinds of spirits, which I think is the most accurate translation. Because I mean, I remember talking to Jane Hammond, Emma Stark, people who are our friends, yeah. I mean, there are multiple spiritual influences going on in the atmosphere. I mean, you can have Holy Spirit, you can have angel. I mean, what, what are some of the different things that we are sensing or picking up when we're operating in distinguishing or discerning of spirits? Sure, well, we can discern, of course, the Holy Spirit. And I think that we, we first and foremost, we need to discern the presence of God. Yeah, yeah. Because when we discern the presence of God and we're really in that moment, we are more likely to be sensitive to anything that is not the presence of That's God. That's beautiful. So discernment yeah. first, I believe, is discerning what is good. I think we get bent many times on discerning what is evil. Yeah. And I do both, you know me, yeah, I'm discerning yeah. witchcraft in an yeah. environment, familiar spirits over here, there's a Jezebel spirit yeah, over there, yeah. right? But then there's an angel over here. Yes. And there's the Holy Spirit over here and the deliverance anointing is manifesting. And so I believe that if we would focus more on discerning what is good, our peace will be disturbed when something that is not good is in our atmosphere. You know what? We have about a minute 30. I would like you to pray for the folks at home. As you were talking about that, I feel like the Lord's saying, listen, I'm not raising up prophetic witch hunters. Yes. We're always on this like witch hunt trying. And I love the model you've set. And I love what you just shared. We want to be discerning what is good, discerning Holy Spirit. So immediately we know what is not. So we have a minute. Would you pray into that? Yeah. So Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank yeah. you for everyone under the sound of my voice. Yeah. And I ask you, Lord, to help us, to train us mm to focus on what is good, to hold fast to what is good. Yes, to test all things. Yes, to judge all things. Yes, yes. to examine all things. But God, help us be so sensitive to your spirit that if mm. anything else tries to crowd into our atmosphere, that we would immediately discern the presence of evil because we are so overwhelmingly yeah. aware of the presence of good. Yes. Lord, increase our discernment for your glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. It's like those who say, in order to spot counterfeit money, they actually study the real thing. So as we continue this conversation, that's our goal. We want to identify and clarify the true so that immediately we can detect, discern the false. So join us, we'll be right back as we talk about true versus false prophecy. Larry Sparks is a prophetic teacher, lecturer on revival, and publisher for Destiny Image. He travels worldwide, equipping everyday believers to encounter the presence of the Holy Spirit in their everyday lives. 
translating God's supernatural power to the spheres of influence they have been called to. Larry is driven by a vision to see the earth filled with God's glory. This will happen only as every person touched by the power of God learns how to become a resting place for the Holy Spirit and releases His power, prophetic strategy, and presence into education, government, media, arts and entertainment, business, family, and the church. As Larry hosts meetings and seminars, the presence of God moves with great power to renew believers, revive the lost, and send forth reformers to change the world. Check out his website for more information. Sparks here with The Resting Place. I have my special guest, Jennifer LeClaire, and we are diving on in. We're talking about discerning prophetic witchcraft, and we were just talking about discerning of spirits, distinguishing of spirits, focusing more on Holy Spirit. What is God doing so that immediately we can detect when something false or inaccurate is in operation? I want to dive into a hot button topic right now, but I think we can have an intelligent conversation because people, I think, when it comes to false prophecy, inaccurate prophecy, I want to call a spade a spade. I don't want to say, eh, it was a boo-boo, I missed it. I mean, if it's false, it's false. We need to own it, take ownership, and repent. But sadly, sometimes when false prophecy, inaccurate prophecy is given, immediately people will write that off and say that person is a false prophet. So. What would you, or how would you define a false prophet? You know, Dr. Michael Brown, a friend of both of ours, a yeah. mentor, um, he once asked me that because I was writing a lot about this. And he said, well, what is your definition of a false prophet? And I said, one who sets out to deceive. Wow. So the motive, it's the motive of the heart. Look, we can all miss it. We all make wrong decisions in yeah. our lives. There are times that, you know, if, if I'm honest, I thought I heard God say something and, and it wasn't God. I didn't yeah. prophesy it, but I mean, from my own yes. life. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, a, 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 a false prophet is one who has the motive to deceive. Now, true prophets can and do miss it. There are many people I've seen in the season who do not believe that a true prophet can ever miss it. Yeah. What they're doing is, Larry, they're looking at the Old Testament paradigm yeah. where they were just real oracles of God. It was like God's God's mouth to their mouth, yeah. pop. You know, it just, there was no room for error. You were their true or false. Mike Bickle taught me this. Yeah, yeah. He said, you know, in the New Testament, we are and we are speaking forth the counsel of God, but we are infallible. So it's our soul sometimes gets mixed in. Yeah. Our biases yeah. Yeah. sometimes gets mixed in. So it's either true or it's false, but that doesn't make the one who prophesied wrongly a false prophet. Well, and I want to encourage those who are watching. I think what you just painted, Jennifer, is a great picture. Number one, okay, Old and New Testament prophets and prophecy is different because in the Old Testament, now there are a lot of similarities, but Old Testament prophets where you have a book in the Bible named after them, they were literally participating in writing the canon of scripture. Hence why when a prophet missed it in the Old Testament or Old Covenant, they would be stoned, they would be killed. Those are not the same specifications. They're not the same um, circumstances of where we are right now in the New Testament. However, it does not excuse, please hear us, it doesn't excuse false prophecy. We can't go around and be like, ah, I just missed it, I guess it's okay. It's one of those things where hearing the word of the Lord is a sacred thing. It carries the fear of the Lord, it carries the tremble of God. So I, I, I wanna navigate that because when a prophet is you know, prophesying incorrectly or inaccurately, and yet they are a true prophet, what would you say, how, how should they navigate that? Like if something... Yeah, I, I think that we have to do what... See, true prophets call for repentance. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. We, we see that through scripture, but true prophets have to be willing to repent when they do miss it. Yeah, yeah. And we've yeah. seen certain ones come forth at different times over the last 20 years where they were involved in something that wasn't accurate or they yeah, didn't yeah. sound the alarm and, and repent. And I think, you know, it was Sean Bowles who told me uh, one time he, he, he really missed it with a word of knowledge that yeah. he shared with somebody. And he said he called them and he, and he repented. Yeah, yeah. And they said, and he told me, they trusted me more. They said, I trust you more 
because you acknowledged yeah. and admitted that you were wrong. Because if we acknowledge that we're wrong, that means we're taking responsibility. Yes, right? yes. And when we take responsibility, we can learn and we can grow. But as long as we just want to shove it under the rug, pretend we didn't say it, yep. well, that's not the fear of the Lord, nor is it a service no. to the body of Christ. And it's interesting because there are different dimensions of the, for example, like I think of, again, going back to an example, at least in the Old Testament, Isaiah, in a couple of chapters in the book of Isaiah, him as a seer prophet could see into the messianic age with Jesus coming. He could see his current time frame and current context, or then he could see eschatologically into the end time. So prophets, I think of people like Kim Clement, yes. they would be caught up in something and they can see multiple eras or multiple moments in history. So it's one of those things we don't want to be so quick to just write something off and be like, well, that didn't happen. I, I think there is a process of navigating this kind of thing. I mean, is it possible though, is it possible for God to give a prophet a word? I mean, we see it, I guess, in the Old Testament where he'll tell the, pe well, tell the prophet, tell the people to turn and repent and the people don't repent. Mm -hmm. And then God's desired outcome doesn't happen. I mean, is that possible for God to will something? It doesn't happen. It is. It is possible for God to will something. God wills that we should all get saved, but yeah. we don't all get saved. Yeah. You know, if you look at the ministry of Cindy Jacobs, who's yeah. been just a fantastic mother figure in my life, you know, she is very wise yes. because she always prophesies the condition. Yes. Because many yes. times prophecy is conditional. Yes. But less seasoned prophets may feel so strongly about what they've heard to be God's will. They prophesy it without God's condition. So we just yeah. think it's going to happen no matter what we do. So we don't have to pray. We don't have to do anything. We're yeah. just going to wait and let God move. But it doesn't work that way. No, no, it doesn't. And I, I want to encourage you because I don't want people to feel burdened by that either, because sometimes what will happen and a prophet will use this as an excuse. It's like, well, we prophesy this, but it didn't happen because you guys didn't have faith and you didn't do that. And there's some context, so I'm sure where that's true. But here's my encouragement. When we get legitimate prophecies, whether it's to the nation or it's to your own life, pray into the prophecy. I love, Jennifer, what you shared here, that when you receive a prophetic word, mm -hmm. what you are doing, more than even just listening to the words that are prophesied over you, you're actually discerning the spirit of the prophetic word. Explain that. Right, I wanna discern the spirit through which someone is talking because at any given moment, someone who is accurate in one moment can be influenced by another spirit. Remember Peter, yeah. he had the revelation from the throne room that Jesus was the Messiah, the yeah. Son of God. Yeah. Another moment, moment later, he took Jesus aside and rebuked him. Yes. And Jesus said, you know, get thee get behind, behind me, Satan. Me, Satan. So he's being inspired wow. by the devil two minutes later. Yeah. And so we have to always judge prophecy. Um, and I listen to the words because look, even if it's, I don't care who it is, yeah. anybody, can miss it. So I want to, does it sound like God? Is yeah. it the way of God? Does it align with the word of God? And yeah. all this stuff I've taught myself to, 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 to just to immediately, you know, make that, make that judgment call. You can record the prophecy and listen to it later. Yeah. And I believe this is why God wants to raise up prophets who more than just predicting things, they are actually training the body of yes. Messiah. They're training the church how to hear God for themselves because ultimately every believer, I believe, has that plumb line directly to the voice of the Lord. You know, what I want to do in just a moment as we go to our next segment, I want to talk about the great move of God that we are, I believe, on the brink of. I do believe that the Lord desires to raise up a company of prophets. I mean, we think of Samuel where it says his words did not fall to the ground. Mm -hmm. I do believe the Lord wants to, desires to raise up a company of prophets who have such a plumb line to heaven that more than just predicting things, they are messengers. They are mantled messengers who declare what is God doing. And then when the church comes into agreement with what the prophets are saying, we will see acceleration and advancement of the purposes and plans of God. However, simultaneously with that, I believe we are on the brink of what Jennifer calls a prophetic showdown. We want the pure, we want the true, we want the fullness of what God wants to release into the earth. But in order to do that and operate in that, we need to hone our Holy Spirit discernment. Join us, we'll be right back for this powerful word. Since 1983, Destiny Image has had a clear mandate. Publish the prophets. 
Over the years, the team at Destiny has identified and published some of the most cutting edge and pioneering supernatural books of the generation. Launching key leaders into visibility and helping bring the people of God into agreement with heaven's prophetic timeline. Every month, Destiny Image releases powerful new books that help believers understand and walk in the fullness of their prophetic destiny to be supernaturally conformed into the image of Jesus. Visit norimediagroup.com to learn about releases from Destiny Image and Harrison House Publishers. And visit destinyimage.tv for thousands of hours of on-demand video training and equipping on how to live a supernatural life. Welcome back to The Resting Place. I'm your host, Larry Sparks, and we are talking about discerning prophetic witchcraft. Here's the good news, though. This book obviously is going to help us discern right from wrong, true from false when it comes to the prophetic. I believe, though, we are in a great move of God right now. And again, one of the signs, one of the hallmarks of a move of God, in the last days I'll pour out my spirit, your sons and daughters will prophesy. Jennifer, I do believe the Lord is raising up a company, an army of prophets and prophetic people who will press into the purity of God and they will see their words come to pass. It won't be this, well, I got this one right, I got this one wrong. I really am contending and I, I know others are for this company of prophets where their words do not fall to the ground and we want to, but, but it's interesting because you talk about in this book, a prophetic showdown is coming and the Lord, I guess, gave you an encounter in 2001. You wrote these words in 2001 and you felt led to prophesy them. Now, what does that look like? Wow, the prophetic showdown. I tell you, you know, not long after I got saved, the Lord just started downloading, you know, this stuff. I, I was a newbie, but the Lord said, there's a showdown coming, the prophetic. I didn't know enough about the prophetic to know that we needed a showdown. So to me, that was like, oh, okay. But, you know, there's so many people now who are following wrong voices. And I'm not saying most Christians, but there are many. There are yeah. too many. Five would be too many. Yeah. There are so many who have followed voices, the false prophets, who have gathered the people unto themselves, the Jezebelic prophets, the Baal prophets, yeah, yeah. just like in Elijah's day. And what was happening was people were falling away from the Lord. And we know there's a great falling away. Yeah, yeah, Paul yeah. prophesied about it. And, you know, we see this great showdown where there's going to be a new breed of prophets who are not afraid to contend yes. with the false prophets, who are not afraid to call them out, who are not afraid to debate with them on a public platform, who are not afraid to call out the, the error yeah. unashamedly. And we see that. And you saw like in, in the book of Jeremiah, was it uh, Han Hanani Hananiah? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And he came against Jeremiah. Yep. Now, now, don't take me wrong. I'm, I'm not suggesting cursing, but he kept coming against Hananiah with all this whitewash. Yeah, and yeah. Jeremiah said, you're going to be dead by this time next year. Yeah, yeah. That's a perfect. Now, I'm not giving anybody no, you know, no. license to curse anybody. But that was in that context. It yeah, was yeah. in that context. And so, it, you know, God never put up with false prophets in, in, the, in the Old Testament. Yeah. They always ended up getting stoned or something would happen to them, but we just put up with it. Yeah. And there's a showdown coming where believers, not just prophets, but yeah. believers are going to say, you know what? I'm not sowing into this ministry anymore. Yeah. I discern your witchcraft. I'm not yeah, going to yeah. go to your conferences anymore. Interesting. I want to talk about what are some of the qualities or the qualifications of a false prophet? Because yeah. we in our charismatic Holy Spirit world get that phrase unfortunately thrown around a lot, but like a false prophet, and you gave a great definition, but some of the things that they believe, I mean, false prophets really reject Jesus. I mean, false prophets reject sound. I mean, what would you say are some of the characteristics of a false prophet? Well, they're not producing the testimony of Jesus. The Bible says the spirit of prophecy is the testimony of Jesus. Yeah. So they might say Jesus, 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 you know, Messiah, 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 Mes yeah. Yeshua, Yeshua, Yeshua. But, you know, they're going to draw people to themselves. Yeah. They're going to be many times money focused. Yeah, yeah. Uh, they are walking many times in an arrogance. Mm. Uh, they're there are often times when they will, uh, they will, they will, they will just can't be held accountable. They yeah. just will not uh, listen to reason. They're not accountable to anybody. They're lone rangers. Yeah. Uh, and, and those are those are some of many we talk about in the book. But uh, they are uh, many times manipulative, seductive, yeah. using prophetic words to get people to do what yeah. they want them to do. And so these are all earmarks of just uh, uh, wrong spirits, Jezebel spirits, Baal spirits. Well, because one of the things we get a lot 
is, oh, that, that was false in the sense that, well, I was at this revival meeting or this, and somebody, you know, manifested, or even like when I think of the great revivals, it's like, well, that, that person, that, that revival, somebody barked like a dog, so that was false, and immediately somebody becomes a false prophet. And I want to tell very clearly right now, because I feel this led by the Holy Spirit, when it comes to false, whether it's a false prophet, a false teacher, listen, some of the things right now that are absolutely categorically false are when people look at the Word of God and they want to redefine what Scripture says based on the direction culture is going in, where they want to look at things that the Bible says clearly are sin. It's like, ah, eh, that's not so bad. You know, culture is going in a different direction. Listen, what the Scripture says is final. Those are the things, Jennifer, that really concern me. And we're seeing this whole, I hate to even use the word, a progressive movement. I'm not talking about pro progressive political politically, but progressive Christianity, where we are wanting to manipulate and change scripture mm -hmm. to actually agree with, oh, you know what, everybody else is doing. Hollywood says this is fine. Media says this is fine. That's when we get into real false heresy movement. Yeah, hyper grace is one of the biggest ones, and oh, we're yeah. seeing major leaders fall yes. who taught the hyper grace yep. message. And so, yeah, you know, we have to stay plumb lined to the word as prophets, as prophetic people, we have to know God for ourselves. My first mentor in the prophetic, she told me this. She said, Jennifer, you have to get everything directly from God. That doesn't mean I can't get counsel from you, that sure. I can't get advice from an elder. Yes. And so if, if we could teach believers that principle, look, God will give you everything. You don't have to chase these prophets. You don't yep. have to hang around and sew on Cash App to get a, a yep. prophetic word. You yep. don't have to buy the prophecy. God will speak to you freely. Yes, yes, He will. And it is one of those things, you mentioned hyper grace, where a lot of those things are a slippery slope. Very. I mean, it's one of those things where sadly you see them going down that hyper grace route and then soon enough, they believe in universalism. Yes. Like, yeah, you don't even need Jesus to get to God. Everybody gets in. So one of the things I want to pray into, we have about two minutes left, Jennifer. I, I really sense that the Lord does want to call forth this pure company of prophets, these prophets who are connected to the plumb line of heaven. I know you have such a passion for that. Would you pray, not just prophets, because people might be like, well, I'm not a prophet, yeah. but just prophetic people who are connected to the voice of God. They hear and they declare with purity. Would you just pray into that. Yes. You know, Samuel had an accurate mouth because he had an accurate ear. Mm. So Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you for the Samuel company yeah. of prophets and prophetic people that you have been preparing in caves, uh -huh. in wilderness places, out of the sight of the world. I thank you, Lord, that you will give them the, the grace, the courage to step out now and use the prophetic voice that you have given them. I thank you, Lord, that you would give them a confidence to know that they've heard your voice and that truth shall prevail in the land. God, we just mm -hmm. thank you, Lord, for this generation yes. that will rise up full of the Holy Spirit and prophetic power to see your will come to pass in the earth in Jesus name. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. And just like Samuel, when he was a child, I just see those hearing, they hear the Lord and Samuel heard the voice of the Lord. And I love what he, what he said, what his response was. He said, speak Lord, your servant listens. At the end of the day, we serve the Lord. We serve the word of the Lord. We serve the call of the Lord. And I wanna encourage you as God calls you, serve him with your life, give your life to him because he is looking for this pure company, not perfect people, we're all imperfect, but he is looking for the yielded. He is looking for those who say, God, on your terms, I give you my life to hear and declare your word in Jesus' name.